Hi, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today I'm going to be talking about pipes, moving our fluids. What is a pipe? A pipe is a tubular section or hollow cylinder, usually, but not necessarily, of circular cross section, used mainly to convey substances which can flow, liquids and gases, fluids, slurries, powders, and masses of small solids. It can also be used for structural applications. Hollow pipe is far stiffer per unit weight than solid members. And that definition comes from Wikipedia. Pipes are not tubes, and this is an important distinction. Tubes are almost always used for structural purpose and are measured by exact OD, outer diameter. Pipes are typically used for transporting substances and are measured by a nominal OD, which is a measurement of the OD on paper, in name, but not actual. Wall thickness can vary for pipes, but if a pipe with a specific OD is ordered, then the OD will not vary, even if the wall thickness does. So in general, what are different pipe types? Well, in terms of materials, pipes are typically made from stainless steel, galvanized steel or iron, or from several plastics, including variations of polyvinyl chloride, which is PVC. Those are typically the white pipes you see. ABS thermoplastic, so that is the same material that Legos are made from, and high-density polyethylene, HDPE. If you live in the United States, that's the number two in the recycling triangle. In terms of pipe categories, there are a few common categories of pipes in use. Some examples of metal seam pipes are below. So a seam meaning it has a noticeable seam where the pipe was welded together. You have ERW pipes, electric resistance welded pipe that is usually made from rolled sheet metal welded longitudinally, so down the length of a pipe. Often this pipe is 24 inches in OD or less. You have FW pipe, which stands for furnace welded pipe, which is typically made from a metal coil fed into a furnace. Then you have SAW pipe, submerged arc welded pipe, is made by welding metal in a longitudinal, so that would be LSAW fashion, or spiral SSAW fashion, with an arc that is protected from the atmosphere. So the arc is submerged in a medium of some sort to protect it from being contaminated from the atmosphere. This is generally used to make larger pipes. So an SAW pipe will probably be larger than an ERW pipe. Then you have DSAW pipe. So it's just like SAW pipe, except it is dual submerged arc welded, meaning there are two welds. And those welds are the ID, inner diameter, and the OD, outer diameter. So submerged welding on both the inside and the outside of the pipe. How are pipes measured? When purchasing pipes or talking about pipe design, what terms are used? In the U.S., pipes are described using the nominal pipe size measurement, NPS. Nominal, like I mentioned before, meaning in name only, so it's not the actual dimension. So a pipe with an NPS of 2 inches does not actually have a 2 inch OD, and wall thickness, which is called the schedule, can vary. However, the OD will always be 2.375 for a pipe with an NPS of 2 inches, but the schedule can vary. The international pipe size standard is DN, which stands for nominal diameter. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the French which is measured in millimeters, of course, and is in the ISO 6708 standard. So pipe wall thickness is called schedule, and that number is derived from a formula that compares the ratio of service pressure, so when the pipe is normally in service, to maximum allowable pressure, a pressure that shouldn't be exceeded in the pipe. Common schedules are 5, 10, 20, 30, 40. 80 is a pretty common one, too. In a lot of what I've read, 40 seems to be the standard schedule that you order for pipe unless you specify. How are pipes made? 
I'll go over a few of the common manufacturing methods. For metallic pipes, you have centrifugal casting. Molten metal, often iron, is poured into a rotating mold, and the molten metal is pushed against the mold by centrifugal force. Think about spinning a bucket around using your entire arm. The water does not fall out if you apply enough force. It's going fast enough with enough force. Literally, for centrifugal casting, it's the same idea, but with molten metal. Pretty cool, I think. What's great about centrifugal casting is that it gives the pipe some great metallurgic properties due to the pipe cooling from the outside in, which is known as directional solidification. In addition, impurities move to the center, the ID of the pipe, allowing them to be machined away. The outer layer will often be removed as well, leaving pipe that has very good metallurgical properties and few impurities. You have piercing and rolling, this is when a heated solid billet, a bar, is drawn over a piercing rod to hollow it out. It then goes through a series of steps to be rolled and uniformly cleaned and cooled to produce a seamless pipe. And seamless pipes are generally considered stronger than seamed pipes due to their lack of a seam. Non-seamless pipe, so pipe with a seam, is in a category referred to as ERW, electric resistance welded pipe, and is considered a reliable and cheaper metal pipe alternative to the pipe types listed above. The pipe is made with resistance welding, a process in which a current is passed through the two metals to be welded together, and due to the metal's resistance to a current, heat is generated, fusing the materials. Plastic pipes, such as PVC, are generally made through extrusion where plastic pellets or powder is melted down, or resin is used, and extruded, pushed, through a die in the shape of a pipe. The pipe is then cooled and cut to the desired length. Pipes used in industry to convey fluids should be marked with the contents of the pipe. In America, we have ANSI, or ASME. Those are the American National Standards Institute and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. They have standard A13.1 2015, used to identify the contents carried by pipes. That standard is shown to the right. The image to the right, however, is for secondary identification. The primary identification marking should state the name of the pipe contents and an arrow to represent directional flow. But, second to that, the color of the marking and the color of the font in the marking can help you identify the contents of the pipe. For example, if the label is green and the font is white, it's material of inherently low hazard. But if it's a yellow label with black font, the material is inherently hazardous. So knowing these colors can help you be safe. The label height and length are also specified based on pipe size in the standards. Healthcare facilities and their pipes follow the National Fire Protection Agency guidelines, so not the ANSI ASME guidelines. The international pipe standards are governed by ISO 14726-2008, which specifies main colors and additional colors for identifying piping systems in accordance with the content or function on board ships and marine structures. These colors can also be used for piping systems on drawings and diagrams. ISO 14726-2008 does not apply to piping systems for medical gases, industrial gases, natural gas, and cargo, but it can be used for land installations, and that is from the ISO website. When discussing pipe mechanics and functionality, there are a few equations that seem to come up a decent amount of the time, and I'll go over a few of them now. But the point of these slides is to talk about what the equation is and what it means and to show it, not to go super in depth on the math behind the equation. We have the Darcy-Weisbach equation. This relates the pressure loss, also called the head loss, from friction over a certain length of pipe, pascals per meter, to the average velocity of the fluid flow. The equation is named after Henry Darcy and Julius Weisbach. Fire sprinkler systems use a similar and simpler equation called the Hazen-Williams formula. So you can consider that pretty similar for the purpose of this video. 
The formula for the Darcy-Weisbach equation is the change in pressure over length, that's what the equation will give you if you solve it, is equal to F sub D, which is the Darcy friction factor, also known as the flow coefficient, times P over 2, which is the density of the fluid in kilograms per cubic meter, divided by 2, times the mean flow velocity of the fluid, squared, divided by the hydraulic diameter of the pipe. The ID of the pipe is circular. I like the example of a fire sprinkler system so much, even though technically they use a more simplified and different equation, but let's just assume we're using the Darcy-Weisbach equation to model a fire sprinkler pipe system. Let's say in a fire sprinkler system, if a denser liquid was used, pudding for example, there would be more pressure lost in the system per meter, assuming that all other variables remain the same. Because pudding has a higher density than water, the density part of the equation is on top, so if everything else stayed the same, you would have less pressurized pudding being shot out over a fire compared to a much more high pressured water. And I really think that image of pudding falling down on fire is pretty comical and illustrates the equation pretty well. Next up, we have Bernoulli's principle. In fluid dynamics, Bernoulli's principle states that an increase in the speed of a fluid occurs simultaneously with a decrease in static pressure or a decrease in the fluid's potential energy. And that definition comes from Wikipedia. The formula for Bernoulli's principle is V squared, the fluid flow speed at a point on the streamline, divided by 2, plus g times z, g being the acceleration due to gravity, and z being the elevation of a point above a reference plane in the direction opposite to gravitational acceleration, so up in the air, plus the pressure at the chosen point, divided by the density of the fluid at all points in the fluid. And all of this together equals a constant, and that's what is important to remember. If something changes, so will something else, so that the result is the same. I have two examples that illustrate Bernoulli's principle pretty well. Imagine holding a hose like you're going to spray your friends with some water. If you block part of the opening of that hose, the water will spray out faster. And looking at the equation, this may seem counterintuitive at first, but think about what is happening in that hose you are giving less area for that water to flow through at the very end of the hose. But because Bernoulli's principle has to be constant, the velocity has to speed up in that narrower section that you're blocking with your thumb. So it's coming out faster at the end compared to how it's moving through the rest of the hose. And because it's coming out faster, there's actually less pressure at that point in the hose system than there is in other points. So velocity increases, pressure goes down. Because it's coming out fast, you might think there's high pressure there, but there's actually less pressure. The other classic example for Bernoulli's principle is an airplane wing. Due to the shape of the wing, air moves over the top of the wing faster than the bottom. Faster moving air on top, less pressure. Slower moving air on bottom, more pressure. So the system is pressure pushing upward. That's the net, because there's more pressure on the bottom, less on top. And finally, let's talk about pressure exerted on pipes. Maximum allowable pressure versus bursting pressure. The schedule of a pipe that we went over earlier defines the ratio between service pressure, so how the pipe should normally be used, and maximum allowable pressure. But there is a third kind of horrible, dangerous pressure. Bursting pressure, when the pipe ruptures. So I have a table below that lists some common maximum allowable pressures and the bursting pressures to give you an example of what kind of numbers are realistic for pipes. Of course, safety factors and temperatures can cause variance in these numbers, so just think about these as more kind of rough estimates. And as a good reference point, the average human male exerts about 8 psi standing. A car exerts around 30. And for those outside the U.S., 1 psi is about 7 kilopascals. So you can see for these four examples I picked, the max allowable pressure is between 3 and 6,000, roughly. And you can see as the diameter of the pipe increases, the max allowable pressure decreases. 
But for the pipe of the same size, the thicker the wall, the higher the schedule, the max allowable pressure goes up, which makes sense. You can also see the bursting pressure is about twice the max allowable pressure. And again, the service pressure of a pipe should be below the max allowable pressure with a good safety factor. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you now understand a bit more about pipes, how to describe their sizes, how they are manufactured, how they should be labeled for safety, and the kind of pressures they can handle. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe. Have a great day!